Okay, so this will be a lecture on linguistics of selfhood. And uh, as an introduction, I would like to mention that I'm in a clear audience. I can hear the voices from heavens and from the air. Now, you may call it a schizo, but to me it is something completely different. And mainly in the Polish territory, I hear Polish and English languages. Mm, when I went to Mongolia, to the Far East, uh, the devas of the ancients were singing to me in unknown languages, lullabies. Uh, that means that um, every territory has certain territorial powers and certain, let's say, um, religious political setting. So uh, I've been traveling widely. I've been to 39 countries on four different continents and every country and every continent has a different setting, genius Loki, different powers, different spirits, and so on and so on. And that's why I could quickly establish that Judeo-Christian bullshit on this territory is one big fat lie and it is contradicting absolutely everything in the world apart from uh, this particular territory. And when I was hearing the voices in Polish trying to convert me to that bullshit, I was thinking in English and detaching my understanding of the Polish language in order to proceed with my more intelligent enterprises. Uh, those Polish voices uh, of the soulets employed and registered in other magic uh, shit and politologists fly pigs uh, tried to convince me in English, but they were starting to talk with a flawed English accent and that betrayed them that they are humans, not uh, some uh, arch intelligences. So uh, each time a person that is naive or foolish uh, that hears those kind of convertible political religious lies thinks that they are voices of angels and prays and kneels and all that and he's already eliminated from the whole occult spectrum of phenomena and aspirations to actually ascend. Uh, now, I also created synthetic languages uh, when uh, upon, for example, I want to switch off completely my mind or uh, utter phrases of Gnosis Aretos. That's a bit Nordic. That's a bit like ancient Chinese, but am I glossolalic? No, I'm just producing those synthetic languages in order to communicate with intention, deed, motive, and so on with my gods, for example. Words are not made for coeds. And this is an ancient Egyptian uh, glyph or hieroglyph that meant to speak, to create with words, with logo. Words that are not used are usually silenced and ignored. Now, when it comes to the Egyptian hieroglyph that was denoting silence, this is silence. So this means command to speak, to create with words. Now, uh, back to the chapter of linguistics of selfhood. To think after we have spoken is foolish. To think when we speak is imprudent. To think before we speak is mindful. To speak reactively is thoughtless. To speak thoughtfully is discerning. To speak inclusively is wise. In public, good speakers command the entire audience in such a way that the average persuasiveness of the speech influences most of them to feel that their needs are being met. While the rhetor influences the audience in an intentional way. In private, good orators penetrate the thoughts of others from their perspective in an empathetic way and conduct the conversation in such a way that the desired function of communication is achieved because they know each other. Now, the use and abuse of language, those who master language, are generally free from its enchantments and influence, both emotionally and to some extent cognitively. They, they master it through silence and they master it through various disciplines. They speak the words deliberately, conveying concepts and ideas in ways that are appropriate for the audience to enlighten, illuminate and help them or to destroy and ruin them. Language users are easily manipulated, enslaved, deceived, threatened or persuaded into extreme folly. They can be seduced by the most blatant contradictions if they do not master at least the basics of semantics, pragmatics, rhetoric, simple logic and semiotics. When silence contradicts words and has more to say, it should be listened to. No charlatans, no disincarnate flying pigs or voices, no malicious people should command over our minds. Both the winged powers and the great gods, deities, communicate through sublime ideas, inspiration, power, force and the greatness of authenticity. The content of all language is known to them and the talkativeness of the earth is transparent. Do you remember the story about uh, Enlil that wanted to exterminate the human race because it was too talkative, it talked too much and they are known in the same manner. Words should be used consciously in communication, whether in written, recorded, taught or spoken form, they should be disciplined first and foremost. The mind should be persuasive, skilled and mastered in the silent knowledge known as Gnosis Aretus. The 
knowledge of the virtue of silence and knowledge of the virtues in communication to communicate with greater worlds. Words were not made for cowards, not for name-calling, slander, deception and misdirectional brainwashing into politics and religion. They were not meant to spread ignorance and low unworthy values, but to strengthen character, inform, influence and in enlighten others, inspire. Those who are passive prisoners of words in this world dance on the strings of the wills of others. The structure of language, its grammar and function manipulates and treats abstract things by reducing them to a sequence of symbols. By imposing its innate architecture on the context of meanings, its structures, thought processes according to its rules. If these structures of logic, syntax and function were to disintegrate, most likely the mental sphere that connects them would disintegrate as well. This could be evidence that the logic of any language conditions the thought processes, back to Sapir-Whorf. There is an underlying meta-system that enables the acquisition of languages. This mechanism is based on the separation of an act in which a fragment is extracted from the whole and given a label. Symbolic labels are shared intersubjectively and evolve into an advanced communication system. The sequence of symbols, words, is bound by rules that generate only as many possibilities as the logic of a particular language allows. Message exchange is possible to the extent that we understand a common system of rules that are transparent to both parties. As an included stochastic process, the probabilities of occurrence depend on past events and a contextual background that delineates and defines the information from a transmission of observations according to the function of the communication. Now, where does metaphysics go in? Plotinus, the Neoplatonist that hated Gnostics and Christians, believed in Nous, a conceptual land beyond language. Nous, the higher aspect, conveys concepts, the lower belong to the senses, memory and imagination. Logos, a mediating factor, the fantastic or imagination that receives and transforms impressions, was the vehicle. An act of remember remembering is an act of reshaping or creating in the imagination. Let's remember that that vile idiot Saint Augustine tried to censor the imagination of the pagans, limiting it to Judeo-Christian bullshit. To enter the land of imagination through the invasion of the act is to find relationships beyond language and words. In the sacred language of silence, echoing with the sacred sound and meaning, the gods speak. The process of idea formation is a process of synthesis or resolution of a thought equation based on a set of data. Memory, knowledge, perception, experience, intuition that strives for logical, creative and rational continuity within a given framework synthesis. Structured existing knowledge serves us to limit the fantasticon of thought. If the fantasticon interferes too much with the cognitive process, it does no harm as long as it is symbolic function is understood. Synthesis may be associated with the reward center. Intellectual hedonic techniques is an acquisition of such a habit. It is based on solving the synthesis in an optimal way, not necessarily, but preferably optimal and correct. The pleasure principle here leads to the nearest resting point because of the economy of cognitive structures. So you have to put a little bit of effort into forming new cognitive structures. Sometimes it takes a counterintuitive overcoming to arrive at a concept or a new idea. In the symbolic reality structures and the processes of resolving thought equations, the emphasis is placed on penetrating reality without superficial conceptions. By understanding, we release energy to satisfy our intellect. Discipline and the ability to construct abstract concepts are required to go beyond the apparent world. All of this depends on cognitive tools, scientific training, creativity, education and the ability to escape the imposed linear thinking imparted by regular education and socialization. To explore the geometry and architecture of thinking, one must begin by exploring nonlinear dynamical spaces as the architects of one's own cognitions and thinking. The first skill in thinking outside of the box is to notice the structures that dominate it, to be aware of them and to know that they are finite and often flawed, as in cognitive bias. An attempt to tweak these structures to experiment to see how the cognitive empirical content keeps falling into them is beneficial, as long as the solutions are consistent with the consistency of existing ideas and knowledge management systems. One of the guides is intuition. It can be an unconscious, irresolvable synthesis for which there are no data sets and which must be explored through associations. Then, vaulted in cognitive content, they can be triggered from a different angle. In this sense, resourcefulness is an alternative, unexpected way of looking at things. This is also a mark of genius. The language of ideas is a way to specify general concepts and perceptual orders in order to communicate without the barriers of the language, mentalis, ideation. 
The principles upon which one builds the interpretive foundations of experience are the entire structure of the thinking style. From this experience, we conjure up the scene of the exchange either by breaking it down into smaller parts or by perceiving it entirely. It is never a complete view, as it involves immeasurable subtleties and vast chasm when trying to describe a strict perception. It is a process of perception by exclusion. It should serve an instrumental purpose to achieve a desired view. Upon this, we build a system of exchange between experiences, uncertainties, fallibilities, and pragmatic aspects of the knowledge produced. It informs the process of understanding primarily. Where reason is defeated, intellect, imagination, feeling, and intuition become the main intersection between ideas and interpretation. And last but not least, there is no sacred language as such as some Hebrews imagine. All languages can be made sacred by exaltation, just like all symbols. To bring out their magical meaning by sensitive, deliberate symbolization is an act of compression into utility. The music of the Pythagoreans and the instruments of antiquity sought to capture the wondrous hum of the universe in harmonies, intervals and obvious planes. Later music has sounded and harnessed various currents and forces to its expression. A perfected language is that of intellectual, soulful silence, which contains all the hidden factors that we try to convey with our limited abilities, forms, thoughts and feelings. Trying to translate it into different magical languages depends on the flexibility and mastery of words and our abilities. Poetry has more to do with symbolic magic, at least in written form, than programming languages, as in computer programming. Philosophy is an original sense, in an original sense, a formal aspect of the poetry of the world. Its only purpose is to leave signs that, when reverse engineered, can lead to similar insights and techniques in others. Berita kades me riva la bta rhtit rovi la krido. Now go figure out what it means. Good luck.